Okay, bye. Hi everybody, thanks for coming. Um, so this is the, the talk outline, and um, yeah, if you have a question, if I you get lost because I just <laughs> go too fast or something like that, feel uh, free to uh, interrupt me. So um, I'll start by talking about childhood cancer and uh, personalized targeted therapy. Then I will introduce the um, this study, which is called uh, Precepts, which is uh, ongoing at St. Justin. I'll show you some preliminary results and then the conclusion, and I hope a lot of questions. So, <clears throat> cancers. Um, these are large family of diseases that involve abnormal cell growth with uh, the potential to invade or spread to other parts of the body. Um, Cancer cells uh, can be characterized by these all marks, which, which are uh, a cell sufficiency and growth signaling. Normal cells uh, won't divide if they are not told to do so. Evasion of apoptosis, which is uh, a normal process of uh, programmed cellular death, uh, which normally occurs when the DNA of a cell is uh, too much damaged. Uh, evasion from immune uh, system, also replicative immortality, also the ability to uh, to get uh, nutrient by uh, stimulated angiogenesis, uh, and finally uh, tissue invasion and metastasis. So <coughs> there are about uh, one thousand five hundred uh, child which are diagnosed uh, each year with cancer in Canada. Uh, despite progress uh, made in the last decade, uh, there's still 20% that do not respond to uh, current therapy and uh, ultimately die from uh, their disease. Uh, but for the majority of survivors, um, there's uh, usually a long-term effect due to drug uh, toxicity. And because a lot of those uh, childhood cancer are rare. Uh, for many of them, little is known about uh, the responsible genomic alteration and specific way to treat them. So, in brief, we need uh, more effective therapies to uh, cure refractory cases and decrease uh, treatment-related morbidity. And we also need to perform a genome-wide investigation to really understand uh, what are, what is, which mutations are causing these uh, cancers, and in which pathway. So, I think may, many of you are, are familiar with uh, this kind of graph. So it shows the progression of the sequencing cost uh, in the, the last 15 years. And uh, I'll just show you that uh, in 2009, the big uh, consortium uh, like uh, the Cancer Genome Atlas started to include the uh, NGS data in their pipeline. And around uh, 2011, they started to uh, publish studies about their results for a specific type of cancer. And now it's possible to sequence uh, a complete genome for less than 10,000 bucks. So, this brings the uh, opportunity to, uh, to perform personalized targeted therapy, which is personalized because uh, we use information about the genes, the protein, and other features of a person's cancer, and its normal genome to treat their disease. And it's targeted because it uses drugs that are more, more specific, that are designed to interfere with a uh, specific pathway or a genetic alteration that promote uh, tumor growth and progression. So now the TRICEP study. Um, it's a feasibility study, so it's really a research project. Uh, the goal is to see if it's uh, feasible to perform uh, PTT, personalized targeted therapy, clinical trials from using NGS data in childhood cancers with poor prognosis, so with no chance of cure, uh, at our institution. So there are a couple of uh, secondary outcomes, like uh, we want 
to know how many uh, patients are suitable for PTT each year, um, which uh, type of mutation, how many we find in those patients, and also how many of those patients are harboring mutations that can be uh, targeted with Health Canada approved uh, targeted drugs. And one of the important goals of this study is to uh, perform the whole process in a clinically relevant time frame, which is um, the, the goal was less than 10 uh, weeks. And we estimate uh, about 30 patients over uh, two years. So um, briefly, inclusion criteria are 21 year old or less uh, at time of enrollment. Poor prognosis, uh, biopsy proven cancer of any type, uh, which are either relapsed or uh, refractory to treatment. The written informed consent by uh, the patient or the parent. And there's uh, uh, the patient need to have an uh, estimated life expectancy of more than three months. Uh, so this is a just to show you how, how, what kind of interaction there is in this project with the different uh, team, uh, and importantly, the, the patient here. Um, so I'll just explain you the, maybe the four uh, steps. Uh, so, well, just number one, when, the, uh, when a, a patient meets the, the criteria, uh, the treating doctor will uh, explain the study and uh, propose for enrollment if the, uh, the, the patient and the family is, um, is okay with that. Uh, then a biopsy will be uh, taken from the, from the tumor. Um, so there's a, a biopsy of the tumor, but also a, a normal a sample of the normal tissue. Um, <clears throat> this, uh, those samples will be, um, I'll tell you, me, I'm part of this, <laughs> this uh, here that I call the, the tumor characteriz characterization team. So once we receive the, those samples, uh, uh, some people on our team will uh, extract the DNA, uh, pre prepare the library. We have a, a sequencing platform at St. Justin where we, we send this for, um, currently it's all exome sequencing, uh, all transcriptome sequencing. Then we're uh, three bioinformaticians who are uh, analyzing the data. Um, then there's an analysis report that is produced. Uh, there's a PTT board, so this involves uh, more than 15 uh, doctors, which will uh, receive the re report and we present the report with the, uh, some, uh, the genetic alteration and some clinically relevant information linked to this uh, alteration. And then uh, the PTT board with the treating doctor can decide uh, to take a uh, clinical decision uh, in regard to these uh, mutation or not. Um, Okay, so now I will just focus on the red, uh, red part. Uh, just to show you uh, uh, how many uh, times it takes for the, the different tasks. Um, so the uh, DNA RNA extraction takes about two days, library preparation up to five days. The sequencing can be up to one week. Then the sequence analysis that we're uh, performing, which can take up uh, to three days. Uh, so I will come back uh, with some details about our little uh, pipeline for this. Then uh, each variant that we detect are, uh, and, and we consider interesting will be uh, are reviewed by the biochemist uh, or the biologist uh, using IGV or UCCG on browser to see if there's a possibility of error because of the, the repeat and things like that. Then the genomic alteration are uh, validated 
And while uh, this is in uh, progress, uh, there is a report uh, writing which is done by the, uh, the biochemist, or the biologist. So the, the sequence analyzes objective. Um, first, we want to identify a variant or genomic alteration. Um, we have three types of uh, a variant, which is uh, so single nucleotide variants and small indel. So it's a mutation involving few nucleotides that can uh, change the the amino acid uh, sequence of a protein or um, cause a frame shift in the protein. Um, copy number anomaly, like uh, the gain of a chromosome or part of a chromosome, and, uh, or deletion. Um, variant annotation, so this variant, we want to know which gene is affected, at which pos position, what is the consequence. Uh, we want to know if it's a somatic or a um mutation. So that's where we, we use the, the, the normal tissue. And we also consider a very well uh, frequent SNP, or less frequent SNP that are available in the database is like 1,000 genomes. And, uh, well, like I said, uh, that's a step where uh, the, the impact of those mutation is uh, estimated, or uh, so. Uh, yeah. uh, <clears throat> now the the big question that we want at the end is to uh, to identify was what we call driver mutation. So the, the mutation that are really responsible for uh, um, for the, the the cancer that drives on on cogenesis, because uh, it's important to know that. Um, while the, the before the, the cancer, um, what how it <laughs> before the cancer uh, emerge, uh, there's a lot of mutation that are uh, accumulated somatic mutation, and the the, the clone that will uh, evolve and that will uh, we will uh, see in the tumor will harbor a lot of those passenger mutations that do not really uh, provide uh, more fitness to, uh, to this population of cells. Because it's important to see that it's like a population of, uh, of cells with, uh, with different mutations, which are subject to different kind of pressure. Uh, it can be the, the treatment in case of the relapse, um, but also uh, with the human, uh, the human system. So um, for this, we, 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 we look at, uh, we have a list of genes where uh, we have known oncogene and tumor suppressor. Uh, we also consider the, uh, the variant frequency. Even if it doesn't give us all the answer, these are uh, information that can uh, help us to, to rank them uh, uh, by their uh, probability even if we don't put a real number of that, uh, of being uh, the drivers. So uh, now the, the pipeline. Uh, when we started the project, we, we needed uh, something very flexible because we were hoping to uh, test different uh, software and uh, we, we didn't find uh, something that really uh, fits, uh, fitted our needs. So like many, uh, like many labs, uh, we, uh, we design our uh, own uh, uh, pipeline manager system. So this is the, 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 the current pipeline, which is, uh, uh, how could I say? We use well-known software, maybe we, we, not maybe, we not using the last, uh, the, the, the last software, for example, the, for the SNP color, we use uh, something that people know uh, well the, the weakness and the, um, and the strength. So, so we use the software, we were um, familiar with that as a starting point. And now we're in the process of testing different, um, uh, different 
software for the different tasks. So it's really the, the, the first step was really to connect all those software and go through the whole loop, starting from the, the sequence and going from the, the report for the biologist. So I think um, just how many of you are working with NGS? Okay, so well, <laughs> most of you are very fam fa familiar with them. So I won't go uh, through all the details since you know these uh, these tools. Maybe just uh, mention that we're uh, um, using the whole transcriptome data for uh, uh, calling SNP, so to see if it's uh, if we have support for the SNP we find in the whole exam and uh, fusion capture for finding fusion. And we have also, uh, we have implemented our uh, uh, a method which is very well known for uh, calling CNA, which is the read that method. But uh, we prefer to, uh, to start from scratch. scratch. Uh, I'll come back to the CNA calling later. So very simply, since most of you are familiar with pipeline, I won't go uh, too much into the detail. Uh, it's just uh, using wrapper. Uh, the nice thing about this one, I think, which make it very uh, flexible, is um, that it can be piped. Um, I'll just show you an example right now. So you can really put the, the wrapper on the command line and uh, pipe them together. Um, I'll come back here just to talk about uh, how it works. Um, so, yeah, so each wrapper uh, will take the input file name, output uh, the output file name, but also the input file name. And um, so the last pipe wrapper will receive all the series of input and output. And um, there's a final script that with that can uh, see the dependency between uh, the job. So for a fork, we, we just use a, a forward uh, procedure to, to do uh, those fork. And so the, this uh, final, uh, wrap, final script, the QPipe, uh, will just look at the dependency, uh, send them to the HPC cluster, and it will also um, parse the uh, log file and all these things to, to look if there are error message and warning. And so it's pretty much what it's doing. Um, OK. So uh, now I'll come back to uh, the, the, the goal of the, the, the variant calling process. Just to show you, um, the, it's a bit like finding a needle in the, in the haystack. It's because we, f for the, the beginning, we use a var scan with very low uh, threshold to be sure we won't miss anything. Uh, so we see, for example, in a patient, we start with uh, 200, uh, about 200,000 uh, possible variants. <coughs> Then we have a, f a, f a first filter, which is simply by uh, uh, by the genes in which these uh, variant occurs. Uh, presently, this gene, li gene list con uh, consists of uh, 733 um, cancer-related genes. Uh, so this uh, without a lot of uh, variant. Then um, somatic filter to see if uh, it's in the 1,000 genomes, uh, uh, is it present in the, in the normal material, etc. And finally, at the end of the process, from those 225,000 uh, mutations, we end up uh, with two, uh, three variants, which, which were sent to, for validation. And finally, uh, two of them uh, were uh, validated. Now a few words about the CNA uh, detection. Um, there have been a lot of publication about uh, CNA detection. 
Uh, most of them use uh, whole genome uh, data. Uh, there have been some uh, results published about sensitivity, stuff like that. But these are really affected by the, 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 the data you're using. The kind of uh, library, the, 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 the quality of the material. So we, we just started with uh, a simple, uh, well-known approach, with, which is a uh, read-depth ratio. Uh, that we can do because we have both tumor and normal material. Uh, so there's no need for uh, normalization according to uh, GC content, stuff like that. And we re realized we, we got very nice results um, working at the gene level when the material is good. For example, you can see here uh, an hemizygous deletion. Uh, this is chromosome 1. Uh, here, uh, you have some uh, amplification here, again of uh, two copy, again of one copy here. And for us, it was very important to have a, a convincing representation for the, the biologists. So, with the chromosomal band, because a lot of mutations in the literature are uh, reported using uh, those chromosomal regions instead of just getting a list of bed file and well. So just for this example, we can see that you, you clearly see the four, uh, the four mode uh, for the different event with very few overlap. So if we then we validate with qPCR, um, well, we got interesting results with that. Now the, the report uh, writing which is a very uh, important uh, part of this project and one part that um, I think um, tools for, um, I'll come back later. <laughs> so for each uh, mutation and alteration that we validated, uh, we want to give to the uh, biologists the information about uh, any clinical or relevant information about the tumor? Uh, can, uh, can, could it help to get a better classification of the subtype of the tumor? Uh, sometimes the, the doctor, they, they, with the genetic test, they can miss uh, some alteration. So anything we can find which is informative, uh, we want to put it in the, in the report. Uh, of course, is there any tar targeting drugs? the drug for this alteration, and directly or indirectly? And uh, are there any relevant clinical trials uh, related to this, uh, this alteration? So it's a lot of work uh, that we would like to automate that we started, but so now, uh, from now it's there's, uh, I won't show you a magic, some <laughs> special thing to just push on the button and get all this information. So. Uh, we use information from a DA, uh, clinical trials, point of, all these things that you, you must know. So this is an example of the report. Uh, so on the front page you have the, the relevant uh, alteration separated by uh, different um, type, uh, CNA, SNV. You have a summary of the genes and of the gene and the uh, the alteration, if there's literature linking to it, linked to it, um, is there FDA approved uh, drug targeting this alteration? The clinical trial, and we try to make it uh, very uh, clear for the the doctor. So put as much information as we can. Uh, for example, here you have the gene TP53 with the position of the mutation and everything. So now, the preliminary uh, results. So uh, there was uh, 10 patients uh, so far uh, for which we produced a report. Um, three, well, not 10, in fact, uh, seven, because three uh, dropped out of the study because of uh, either uh, screen failure, which is an uh, impossibility to get um, uh, tumor material, 
or uh, because it was a benign, benign tumor. So, uh, okay, so I'll just, uh, so you can see the different genes. Uh, I put a, a column for relevance. Uh, so put yes if there was something informative for the, for the doctor. Uh, so this thing is uh, very, um, I would say, preliminary <laughs> because uh, it's, the doctor needs to, uh, to define exactly when it is considered informative because it can be a, a little bit informative or a lot informative, but uh, uh, there was at least uh, something um, we judge helpful for the for the doctor in uh, so most of the these patients. But doesn't mean that um, an action has been taken. But I will give you some uh, some, some case uh, of what we find found. Um, <clears throat> so in the first patient from the the transcriptome uh, transcriptomic data. We found a null fusion uh, connecting the, the promoter of uh, two genes, and one is uh, ASNS, which is uh, asparaginase uh, synthetase, synthetase, which is um, which catalyzed the uh, synthesis of asparagine, the amino acid. Um, this gene is usually not expressed in white blood cells since these cells rely on uh, asparagine taken from the blood. And there is a drug called asparaginase, which is a chemotherapeutic uh, drug used for the treatment of uh, leukemia, which works by decreasing the, le the level of asparagine in the blood. And so this fusion was detected in a relapsed uh, cancer from somebody who received uh, asparaginase. And oh, the things to say, the important thing, is that when we compare the expression of this gene in the normal and the, uh, no, in the diagnostic and uh, relapse material, uh, we found, we measure uh, 30 uh, x of fold of the expression. So it's, there's good evidence that it's strong, it's linked to the resistance to uh, at least uh, this drug. Um, there was another fusion also in this patient, um, which was, in this case, a, a well-known fusion that occurs often in this kind of, uh, of leukemia. And uh, this fusion can be used for um, uh, minimal residu residual disease uh, monitoring. So it's a tool that uh, that can be very helpful for the for the for the doctor to monitor the the disease. So so that's what happened with the, the first patient. Um, another interesting case is um, a child who had a uh, parasitic astrocytoma. Uh, it's a slow-growing brain tumor. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, classified as benign because it's not uh, invading. It's like in a, well, it's separated from the uh, other tissue, but uh, it slowly grows and ultimately it causes problem because it will push put a lot of pressure on the on the brain and. A lot of time, these uh, tumors are, are monitored. They, they don't go straight for, uh, straight for the, the surgery because surgery of the brain, of course, uh, can be very, very risky. Um, but when it's possible, it's highly effective. So for, uh, in this case, uh, oh, one thing to say. Um, in this disease, there's a BRAF uh, mutation, which have been found in, um, 10 to 15 percent of case, and there are some case reports of uh, complete clinical regression with uh, BRAF inhibitor. So this is 
the, the kind of uh, information that we can present to the to the doctor. And but the mutation we found, so that's the the catch. But it was not uh, easy like this. It's a tandem repetition, uh, uh, tandem duplication uh, involving the. Uh, the repetition of three amino acid, and of course, uh, the BRAF uh, inhibitor uh, are specific to some mutation, and so now we're in the process of uh, testing the, on this particular mutation the effect of uh, BRAF uh, inhibitor to see if there's a if there's an effect. And since this was an interesting case, uh, the, the doctor decided to postpone a little bit the surgery because it was a, a risky one. And they thought, oh, maybe that could be a, a good option. Um, other kind of, uh, for another patient with informative mutation, um, this happens uh, often, I think. So, for example, a loss of one copy of TP53, um, and the other copy pro probably inactivating because uh, there was a, a non synonymous mutation in the remaining copy. And also, um, the deletion of two, uh, the two copies of these two genes that are uh, very well known and involved in. Uh, uh, cancer. So, well, how TP53 can be uh, informative when uh, we know literature, uh, in the literature we, we see that uh, uh, chem some chemotherapy can be ineffective when uh, TP53 is uh, inactivated. So that's the kind of information that can be helpful to know the status of uh, TP53 for the for the doctor, and then for the other one uh, uh, mutation here, CDKN2A. Uh, well, we 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 reported the uh, um, the existence of CD4 uh, inhibitors, which are uh, uh, repressed by the. Uh, this genes, which was completely uh, deleted. Okay. Well, uh, <laughs> in conclusion, um, our results show that um, uh, PTT based on NGS data using the uh, old exome sequencing and old transcriptome sequencing uh, is a promising approach <coughs> to improve child. Uh, child cancer care. Uh, we identified clinically relevant information in six out of seven patients. Uh, we were able to complete each uh, analysis within a reasonable time frame of eight to uh, twelve years. But since it's uh, just uh, the beginning, we're confident that we there's a lot of step that could be. Uh, much faster. So for us, uh, it's not where we see the problem, the time. Well, um, uh, the challenge that still needs to be addressed, um, we, we need to uh, assess more precisely the, the sensitivity of the, the variant calling, especially uh, for the CNA, the endels, and the fusion. Uh, so the specificity can be overcome by validation, but what about sensitivity? It's important to to say we were not able to we're not able to confirm you that uh, TP53 has the wild type status. It's it's very important to uh, to be able to say that. Um, of course, we want to to adjust our pipeline, uh, trying other color. Uh, for example, now we're uh, we started trying uh, mutate. Um, so just to really uh, keep informed about the last tool and uh, try them. Um, maybe some tool to better uh, 
describe or play with the, the different pathway. Uh, for us, uh, in the, for the moment, it's um, uh, well, it's a good thing that it's done manually because uh, sometimes I don't think we, we should rely too much on the magic uh, black box, but it will be, um, I think it's uh, uh, somewhere where, they, where they, you know, there can be uh, some development. Uh, we would like to maximize the use of our RNSSEQ data for the moment. We just look at, uh, we use it for um, the fusion detection. And uh, I think one of the, the major uh, challenge that still need to be addressed is um, after the, the variant calling. All, all which is uh, annotation and link uh, with the, the relevant medical information, all those things that involve uh, going on um, in many databases, and uh, I think uh, this is one of the places where we, we need uh, improvement. Uh, so it involves uh, the formalization, the organization, and the mining and sharing of uh, medical and genomic uh, knowledge. So I'll go with the thanks. Uh, the head of uh, the PI of TCEP is uh, Dr. Uh, Monia Marzuki, which is uh, an oncologist at uh, St. Justin. Uh, the bioinformatics analysis is done at the Daniel Sinet uh, in our lab. Um, so well, Thomas, Biobank manager, Sylvie, which uh, which works on the report and the, the validation library pre, uh, preparation. Uh, me and uh, Pascal we're, uh, and Patrick, we're uh, working on the, the pipeline and uh, the analysis adjustment. So this is the, the, the PTT board member. So, uh, and just in case some of you are looking for <laughs> We are recruiting uh, MSc and PhD student. Uh, uh, if uh, you know some people who you are interested to work on this kind of thing, so thank you. So any questions? Yeah. This is the Ernestic data is uh, available uh, publicly available? No. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can ask my, my boss, if, but I don't think, uh, no, it's, uh, you need to uh, enroll as a PhD student and have your card at <laughs> the hospital and then start your PhD and maybe you can do it. <laughs> so I, I'm assuming that for most of the cancer, there is a small subset of known mutation that you can take action on. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, so have you considered the idea of doing targeted sequencing and only sequencing those regions on which you know you can act on? Uh, on the, a lot of these, for some of the can, uh, these cancer, there are uh, yeah, a few mutations very frequent, but there is a lot of unfrequent mutation. And so part of this project is also to identify this new one, and we hope that our list of targeted genes will uh, grow and um, of course if we were uh, a company uh, planning to uh, do this kind of thing and not actually there are some companies doing this uh, most of them use uh, gene panel as you as you say um, but uh, I've seen one company offering a uh, whole genome I don't know but uh, for us of, of course if, if I say, uh, yeah, we just figured out uh, 900 uh, genes, of course we should do a, a panel uh, on this. But it's just a filter for a moment, and we try to see. Uh, but the mutations are, are not discarded for. Uh, I mean, part of the, the project is also to do. Uh, those mutations that are not in the list are also uh, put in our database and can be useful in the, in the future. So that's why we, we, uh, we decided not to do uh, uh, just a panel. So um, I see that you're using Fusion Catcher, yeah. a software to detect fusion uh, 
like Fusion. So I'm wondering if you tried other Fusion software. I tried, uh, yeah, I tried to uh, install two of them <laughs> with no documentation and things like that. Then I made my, I started to parse a star um, output script. It worked, but I, I mean, uh, we have a limited amount of time, and then I wanted to, to filter uh, for the repeat, for the pseudogene, all this thing. And then a, fr a friend of mine uh, uh, working on uh, this kind of, uh, working a lot with cancer and fusion, um, suggested me to, uh, to try fusion catcher. And now that's the, the, the best thing I found. But if you have other uh, tools that you can suggest, I'm, uh, we really uh, we want to try them and compare them. Because I've been using Diffuse for a while, but it gives you a lot of hits, most of which are just false positives. Mm -hmm. And I tried to install two other Fusion software programs, but they're really hard to get to install. Yeah, it's wonderful. That's so why I Fusion. decided to just use a star. It's very good at align and just filter up. No, they are. These are black box, and it's. Uh, no. <laughs> Thanks. Are you just looking for the mutation in coding? Sorry. Genes? Sorry. Are you just looking for the, the mutations in the coding genes, or looking yes, for yes. antigenic regions or non-coding regions? Uh, for a moment, yes, because uh, it's exon capture. Okay. So maybe we have uh, some. Sequence uh, elsewhere, but it's not. Uh, it will not be practical. Uh, I think for a moment, but uh, a lot of people are um, selling the whole genome uh, experience <laughs> with all those big files, and maybe they will have. Uh, it will be, uh, but there's not a lot of uh, information about those SNP outside. Sometimes in the promoter, but for now, it's it's really just, uh, um, yeah. It's really just coding. Just to follow up on the, the Colin's uh, question, uh, you, you mentioned that you were looking only at a subset of, of the coding genes. How is that list defined, and how does it evolve over time? Okay, uh, so before I started to work on the project, uh, it, they took a panel of genes uh, and the cosmic database. And uh, now we're in the process of uh, not having a filter based on those genes, but to uh, have the genes and the documentation, the, not the documentation, but the information we can have for each genes. So to regroup them by categories, uh, those who are known for oncogene and, um, uh, or tumor suppressors. So now I'm in the process. I've um, I've looked in maybe 20 different uh, resources. Uh, so all the, the, the gene panel uh, that are offered by a company, I'm uh, considering them. Uh, well, they have a good chance to be <laughs> useful. But also, uh, there's uh, many, uh, there's some publication uh, that, uh, uh, for example, just uh, three weeks ago, a big uh, study uh, really related to, to personalized uh, therapy, which identify, uh, identified uh, f uh, 400, about 400 uh, drivers from a uh, uh, large thousand of cancer. So uh, there's a lot of resource, and uh, I'm trying to figure out which, which of them are, uh, uh, are trustable and uh, so we're in the process of making a, a more, um, a bigger list. And also what I want is a ranking of the genes instead of just uh, a filter, a plain filter uh, like this. So there you can get genes on the, on the FDA. You want to be sure you don't miss them in drug bank, the targets, all these things. But uh, also there are, for example, in those analyses, I just mentioned where they look at the large cohort and identify potential driver by uh, mutation frequency. Uh, in the, the bottom of those lists, 
uh, you have genes that may be not in so much interesting now, but in the future will get more uh, study, the less frequent one. So it's, it's really important to keep uh, up to date and to look at what uh, other uh, people have done to produce such lists. But one thing that um, uh, I can say is that when you compare different lists, you have a small core of genes that always uh, come back. But there's a lot of genes that are present in just one reference and just one other, so it's... Um, How do you, you report those back to the, the, the clinician, the, the one that's going to make a decision, right? Oh, this gene is maybe interesting because it's in cosmic, but not in this thousand... No, no, it's not based on that. Um, for, for example, in our list, filtering, uh, filtered list, there are some, uh, some genes that there is no uh, convincing information. So uh, we don't report, uh, we will report those genes, but uh, it's not, it will be, for example, uh, I mean, it's not uh, necessarily uh, clinical information, uh, very, uh, the, 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 it's, uh, <laughs> it can be like, I, can have been identified in one study in one cancer, but you know the the, the doctor will must uh, read about the, the reference, not read all the reference, but uh, make judgment. Uh, of course, some of them are, are less interesting than, than others, um, but uh, yeah, these are big lists, and it's uh, for example. Uh, uh, I think we, um, the data mining tools to, to parse some uh, very good medical literature could be used to uh, refine these lists and, uh, yeah. and, in my opinion, very importantly, to rank those genes uh, in some way and, and classify them. But for a moment, it's just a filter uh, uh, that we use. Uh, do you use, uh, I suppose you use H19? Mm -hmm. Have you, uh, you think it would make a difference if you use H38 or? Oh, not different. I just got a data set today of six exome samples, so. I think it would be very interesting to compare uh, both. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm not sure about the difference about what, do you know uh, what are the major differences between uh, I posted on set count because I'm waiting for people to answer for me. <laughs> or, but, or I'll do a comparison. I'll probably gonna run both and I can compile it. So, so. Has anyone done both? Has anyone compared? I think the only difference is the name of the chromosome, it's the name of the context. Very, very few. Yeah. No, but also the number of, of genomes that were used to make the reference. So yeah. Reference. The, the reference in terms of sequence and then the position is minimal. But is it a lot longer? Maybe just for SNP, so we did. Yeah, okay, uh, so that was a great talk. Uh,